The chair now recognizes the president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Gerald E. Harmon, for his presidential address. Good evening, Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice Speaker, members of the board, delegates, colleagues, guests. As a disclaimer, I am a family doctor, and I play one on TV. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here in person, tonight for the first time in my presidential year. Ironically, it's occurring at the end of my, my year, and my term comes to an end, but I'm just real grateful for your support during what's been a unique and challenging period for medicine, for the nation, for the world. This is also the first time I get to express in person my gratitude to so many. To the members of the House of Delegates for honoring me as your president, to my fellow officers, trustees, especially to Chairman McCamela and the presidents before me, Bailey and Harris. To the wonderful senior leadership and employees that work for the AMA, I can't begin to thank you enough as we've learned and grown throughout these two difficult years. In the audience tonight, you'll also find a handful of my immediate family here in Chicago. I'm pleased to have here up front two of my great eight grandchildren, Porter and Dupree Harmon. Y'all stand up up there. They're over here up front. I warned them about this. <laughs> this is their first visit to the big city in Chicago. They get to see escalators and tall buildings, so they're excited about it. <laughs> also sitting with them is their grandmother, my high school classmate, my girlfriend, my spouse, guidance counselor, enabler in chief of over five decades, Linda Harm. Words can't describe how, how fully blessed I am with Linda and with my family and how absolutely lost I would be without their constant love, accommodation, and support throughout my career. They're a true example of a team in action. You know, as coronavirus continues, it's inevitable, relentless strive to infect every human being on the planet. It appears to be at the same time a little bit less threatening with, uh, uh, to those who've been vaccinated and boosted. Hospitalizations and death from COVID thankfully remain low right now, but as, as new Omicron subvariants crop up and create surges, it's impossible for us to say where we might be later on this summer and into the fall. In several prior speaking opportunities, I compared the COVID pandemic to war. Both can be a matter of life and death. Both can be extremely costly in human and economic terms. And the price of fighting both can often lead to physical, emotional, and financial exhaustion. This has certainly been the case for doctors and other health care workers who have borne an oversized burden caring for the sick over the last couple of years, especially those on the front lines in hospitals and clinic settings. Now, as COVID-19 gradually moves to an endemic stage, we must work to ensure that, that capacity to fight the virus remains strong, that our hospitals don't become overwhelmed again, that the public remains vigilant about minimizing their risk through vaccinations and other means. We continue to recognize and remember the courageous men and women in our medical community who gave their all responding to COVID. In the darkest days of the pandemic, amidst fear, confusion, and systems pushed to the brink, it was up to doctors to hold it all together. It's, let's not forget, even apart from the pandemic, this is a challenging time to practice medicine. We find ourselves on the front lines of responding to the epidemic of gun violence in our schools, our communities, and hospitals. Sometimes we even ourselves are the victims of direct attack. We're also subject to increased government interference in patient-physician relationship and the practice of medicine. Whether the issue is women's reproductive health, care for transgender persons, or appropriate treatments for COVID, you know, the AMA, and we should demand that the government get out of the, our exam rooms. Despite, despite all the challenges, it's physicians who are rising to this moment, day after day. It's physicians our nation turns to, hour after grueling hour, for answers, for treatment, for help. You've taken care of our nation at great personal sacrifice. It's time our nation renews its commitment 
to you. We need a recovery plan for America's doctors, and the AMA is ready. The recovery plan we've developed recognizes sacrifices physicians have made over the past couple of years, and it lays out concrete actions that policymakers must take for physicians and the patients we serve. We need to expand telehealth. We need to reform the Medicare payment system. We need to stop unsafe scope expansion. We need to fix prior authorization. We need to reduce physician burnout to retain and rebuild our workforce and address the stigma around mental health. If necessity is the mother of invention, nowhere has that been more apparent than in the enormous shift we've all experienced to remote care during the pandemic. Remote meetings, remote care. In March of 2020, as everything closed down, physicians discovered we had to find new ways of providing care for our patients, for those who needed it. So 90% of us adopted telehealth, treating patients, and half of us for the very first time. Many patients also found for the first time they could receive services in the comfort and safety of their own homes. Due to the AMA advocacy, CMS made changes to ensure that telehealth payment rates for, were equivalent to in-person services, including audio-only services, which means telephone calls. And then a funny thing happened. Doctors and patients discovered this, this ain't such a bad idea under any circumstances. It's safe, it's convenient, and for many patients, certainly less time consuming than a drive and a trip to the visit to the office. In my rural community, patients have substantial barriers, geographic barriers like rivers, swamps, islands that contribute to substantial long travel delays. Digital health is a godsend to these patients. It's not appropriate for suturing a wound or setting a broken bone, but it's a hugely beneficial method for chronic disease management, for care coordination, and things like telepsychiatry for, for a community like mine with an exceptional shortage of behavioral health resources. We know the vast majority of patients and physicians want the type of care to extend beyond the declared public health emergency. Telehealth's here to stay, and we are fighting to update our laws and regulations to reflect that fact. Another component of the AMA recovery plan is leading the charge on Medicare payment reform. Medicare physician payments are the only component of health care delivery subject to budget neutrality, another dirty word. Adjusted for inflation, our rates have fallen 20% since 2001, an average of about 1% a year. As a result of various legislative and regulatory provisions implemented prior to and during the COVID, we were threatened actually with a 10% pay cut this past January. Thanks to the pressure of the AMA and others in organized medicine, Congress acted at the last minute to prevent these cuts. Now, this is a major victory, but we shouldn't have to suffer this annual cliffhanger. We also need a permanent solution to end the battles that threaten the economic survival of physician practices. We must lay the groundwork within medicine and among policymakers to address the flaws and bring stability to the Medicare payment system. We, gotta, we have to be able to predict financial returns with reliability in order to invest technologies and infrastructure like technologies and treatments. In short, we're really done with short-term patches and, and lumen cuts. This just ain't no way to run a railroad. The next element of our recovery plan is stopping unsafe scope expansions. Quality, affordable health care is only possible with teamwork. We do rely on non-physician providers, on nurses, other health care workers to do the invaluable work that they're trained to do. My practice, for example, has a superb team of staff delivering this team-based care. We've got physicians, APRN, physician assistants, social workers, dedicated office staff, and others all in one roof. But our patients need to trust that a physician is leading this team in their care.
We've got years more educations, thousands of hours more clinical training than other members on this very important team. And we're better prepared to treat complex cases and complications. You know, we can draw an analogy with, let's say, air crew shortages, such as the aviation industry is currently uh, facing. Some of you may have experienced that traveling here. As an industry in uh, airplane flying, which I have some experience. You know, ground crew and the flight attendants play absolutely critical roles in getting airplanes off the ground and to the destination safely. The airline industry just could not function without them. But no one suggests that they fly their planes or that we use them to fill an expected shortage of airline pilots. <laughs> Experience and training count when it comes to both passenger safety and patient safety. You know, since this is primarily a, a state issue, we're working with our federation partners through the scope of practice partnership to defeat the recurring unended scope of practice expansion bills, uh, bills that are passed, proposed during each state legislature annually. The next element of our uh, recovery plan proposes that one of the, fixed one of the burdens that physicians find most frustrating, prior authorization. You know, we had a recent AMA survey and it showed that 93% of doctors reported that hurdles imposed by prior authorization medi uh, for medication for testing and procedures resulted in significant care delays for the patients. You know, four out of five doctors said that these processes have led for patients to abandon treatment. Abandon treatment, can you believe it? Navigating these hurdles is an incredible burden for physicians and, and nurses and staff. They've got to spend a lot of valuable patient care time doing this. I've personally done this more times than I can count in order to make sure my patients got the care they needed. Four years ago, the AMA developed a consensus statement on improving the prior authorization process together with other national organizations representing health care plans and providers. And unfortunately, since then, insurers have done precious little to implement them. These were agreed upon improvements. It's time to hold them accountable. That's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing for pushing for legislative and regulatory remedies at the federal and state levels. About a dozen states now have comprehensive reforms in place, uh, many based on the AMA's model legislation. The final element of our physician recovery plan, and potentially the most important, is to develop a health system that re retains existing physicians, attracts new physicians, and reduces burnout. For over a decade, the AMA has been working to remove administrative barriers like prior authorization that can clearly lead to burnout. But we know solutions have to go a lot further. We've got to have ways to find doctors to address their mental health needs without fear of negative repercussions, be able to practice their skills without threats of hostility or violence. This past March, we took a great step forward with the passage of the Dr. Lorna Breen Health Care Provider Protection Act. This new law, which was named after a young physician who took her life early in the pandemic, with, with direct, will direct more funding and resources to support the mental health needs of physicians. Shortly before her death, Dr. Breen had been concerned and anxious that the stigma of reaching out for help, which she needed, would permanently damage her career. You know, if we're honest, some of us might have had that, felt like that ourselves sometimes had the same concern. That's why the AMA and is working at the state and national levels to reform outdated language and medical licensing applications and employment agreements, credentialing credentials that could be stigmatizing. We're supporting legislation that create confidential physician wellness programs so doctors and medical students will have somewhere to go when they need that kind of help. America's doctors are a precious and irreplaceable resource. <laughs> Physician shortages already projected to be severe before COVID have become a public health emergency. If we aren't successful with this recovery plan, it'll be even more challenging to bring talented young people into medicine and fill that expected shortage. There's no easy path to becoming a doctor, but we know we must address these barriers that are keeping people out. 
particularly students from underrepresented communities. We need to reduce the amount of that medical student debt that students need to complete their education. It's currently over $200,000, especially if we're attracting physicians to rural America. We need to expand the number of residency slots. We need to remove Medicare funded positions that Congress put in place decades ago. We need to win funding from Congress that supports the creation of new medical schools and residency programs at historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and tribal colleges and universities. <laughs> Providing and encouraging pathways for people from underrepresented communities to enter the medical profession is a key component of our AMA health equity work over the past couple of years. It's been a major focus. I'm proud to have been able to play a role in advancing racial justice and health equity in medicine during my presidential year. This, this work is long overdue and it just must continue. You know, my friends, this recovery plan is ambitious, but it's doable. AMA is here to be our unified voice to lawmakers and to those in positions of power. The recovery plan is how we're going to move forward. By prioritizing meeting the needs of physicians, we also improve patient care. We're all better off when doctors can focus on medicine. In each of these speeches that I've had during my presidential year, uh, I've asked us to remember the words of Revolutionary War physician and a Major General Joseph Warren, killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. He asked his countrymen to remember that their decisions and actions at that critical time in history would affect the lives of generations of Americans yet unborn. As my term as president comes to an end, as we push for recovery plan for America's physicians, understanding what's at stake for the future of our profession, for our patients, for our country, I ask again that we act worthy of ourselves. I give you my solemn vow that I shall endeavor to do that, just that, each and every day. And I thank you. I thank you all. That, that appreciation, that recognition hits me in the heart, and I appreciate it. Your recognition means a lot. I want you to stay tuned. we got a brief video here that captures the spirit behind the recovery plan for America's physicians. I think you'll like it. When we needed you most, you were there. When the world seemed to fall apart, you held it together. After two years of taking care of this nation, it's time this nation renews its commitment to you. We need a recovery plan for America's physicians. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, securing billions in emergency funding, preventing Medicare cuts, fighting for telehealth coverage and payment, combating misinformation, and backing science at every turn. We're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge in reforming Medicare payment, and supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. We will meet this challenge together. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready.